My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. All right, well, we are in this series titled Give Thanks, our Thanksgiving series. And I don't know about you guys, but it has been a huge blessing for me studying Psalms 145. As you see from our Im images on the wall back here, we talked about how we're thankful. We can give thanks because God is worthy, because he's worthy of our thanks, because he is a marvelous, miraculous God. We can give thanks because God is good or because God is gracious and he is good to his creation. We can give thanks because God is generous and he provides for us. And today we're going to be discussing that we can give thanks because God answers prayer. We're going to be again in Psalms 145. Today's passage is verses 17 through 21. Feel free to go ahead and turn there in your Bibles or your iPads or your iPhones. I'm going to read the entire chapter of 145 just so we can kind of relive what David is speaking of here. The passages on the screen will begin in verse 17 with our passage today. So please listen and follow along. Psalm 145, a song of praise of David. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your work shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up, who, raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Here's where our passage begins today. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and is kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry, and he saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Let us pray this morning. Father, we are so eager. We are so eager to jump into your word to see what you have in store for us. As we've seen these few prior weeks, there is so much for us to give thanks for. As David pours out in this psalm, you are an incredible God, a God worthy of our praise. You are an incredible God who is good and gracious to us, a generous God, and God, you are a God who is here with us, 
eager to hear us, eager to be with us, eager to answer our prayers. Father, please bless me this morning. Guide my words. Allow these thoughts not to be those of Mark Burkholder, but allow me to properly interpret your message, your word, for this congregation. Father, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Who is your favorite superhero? Right? Superheroes are all the fling right now. I don't know if that's a word, but they are everywhere. Right? There's movies out. There's TV shows out. Superheroes are everywhere. If I were to have a birthday party, it would be superhero themed. All right? There's the arrow. There's Flash. There's Superman, Batman. I could go on forever, but that's all I can think of right now. But superheroes are all over the place. And why do we like superheroes so much? Because they have flashy costumes? Maybe. I wish I could pull off tights that well. All right? Because they have alternate personalities. Very true. That's what Facebook is for. All right? But I believe that the reason we love superheroes so much is because we recognize the human need for a hero. We recognize that me and my condition, I need a hero. And what better way for a hero than a man who flies and can look through walls? And Superman. Right? Now, all those superheroes might not be real, as in Superman and Spider-Man and the such. They not, might not be real. I believe superheroes are real. I believe there are real-life superheroes in our world today. Uh, well, at least children do. Children believe there are real-life superheroes, and they all answer by one name, Dad. Right? Dad, in the eyes of children, are oftentimes visualized as superheroes. Going around Facebook, there have been um, some videos called Dad Win videos. I don't know if you guys have seen them. I absolutely love these because they show the superhero factor of dads, all right? So I have a few clips that I want to show you as proof that dads are superheroes, all right? This very first one. Here we go. Dads are superheroes because they have super speed. In fact, they can run faster than a moving vehicle to save another. (laughs) Dads also have lightning fast reflexes to save the day and the desserts. Dads will sacrifice themselves in order to protect the life of another. And lastly, this is my favorite, dads never rest. They never sleep on the job, but are always prepared to save the day. See that? Dads are superheroes. I know when I was growing up, I thought my dad was the superest of all superheroes, right? He was the smartest guy in the world. I mean, he could do multiplication in his head. Like, he was super, super smart. I thought that he was the best basketball player to ever grace this earth. Forget about LeBron James. We have Brian Burkholder with us. He could make threes like no other. Notice it's past tense. All right, he could make threes like no other. This one might be surprising, but I thought he was the funniest man alive. I thought he was absolutely hysterical. He could make anybody laugh. He still can. I think it's just because you guys want to make him feel good or something, but man, he can make you guys laugh so easily. He was the boss of everybody. Right? Everybody respected him. Everybody looked up to him. He said what to do, and people did it. My dad was a superhero. But far beyond my dad being a superhero because of all these things that he did, the thing that blew me away is that my dad was the first one to respond when I needed help. He was the first one to be there when I cried out for help. My dad was the first one to have his arms around me, comforting me, saving me, saving the day. Because my dad was a superhero. Now, as a child, I recognized this need for a superhero. And that didn't fade as I got older. I would argue that with a lot of you guys, I would assume it's the same. That as I got older, my need for a superhero didn't fade, but rather it magnified more and more. To where I'm at the point now, and I know that it will continue to grow, that I realize that I have a desperate need for a superhero. A desperate need that my dad can't fully fill but a desperate need in which I need a hero far greater, a hero that is godlike. I need a savior. That's what David is talking about in today's passage. In Psalm 145, he describes the greatest superhero. He describes our Lord and Savior, the God 
of the universe. He begins the passage by saying that God is perfect. He says that God is perfect. We see exactly in the passage that he says he is righteous in all his ways. See, perfection is a concept that is difficult, if not impossible, for us to understand. This idea of perfection in everything you say, everything you do, perfection entirely is something that is difficult for us to grasp because it is something that we could never attain. But this idea of God's perfection is crucial to the Christian faith. It is absolutely necessary for us as believers because if we believe in a God that is just a smidgen less than perfect, then he is not God. You see, God is perfection. If there is anything more perfect than God, that is God. But our God is a perfect, perfect God. Deuteronomy 32.4 says this, The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. Psalm 18, verse 30 starts like this. This God, his way is perfect. You see, David begins to explain God's perfection, as we said, by saying that his ways are righteous. That he is righteous in all his ways. Now, this righteousness, being that he is righteous in all his ways, applies to every single one of God's attributes. Right? He is righteous in his love, just as he is righteous in his wrath. He is righteous in his grace, just as he is righteous in in his justice. No act minimizes another attribute and maximizes the other. But rather, everything he does maximizes the righteousness in every single attribute he has. He is loving while he is a God of wrath. He is a jealous God, yet he is a God of grace. This is a righteous God perfect God. This is the God that as believers we serve. We have the privilege to serve. Growing up, there was a time that I got in trouble. I'm pretty sure it was just once. All right. Don't be disappointed. All right. Pretty sure there was a time I got in trouble. Um, I I asked my parents to think of a time when I got in trouble, and they couldn't even think of one. So there you go. There you go. Proof. I don't remember what I did. I just remember the punishment. All right. I did something for, um, for the purpose of the illustration, we'll say that I talked back to my dad, all right? I talked back to my dad, but what I remember is that I was sent to my room for a timeout. Now, being by myself, that's never been a punishment for me. I'm a secret introvert. I, I can entertain myself for hours and hours and hours and don't need to talk to anybody. I right? am perfectly all right with that. The incredible punishment part, though, is being up in my room knowing that my parents were upset with me. See, my biggest struggle is that I am a huge people pleaser. This is one of my biggest spiritual struggles even, is that I need people to be pleased with me. So if I do a terrible job today, just tell me I did a good job, (laughs) all right? But I need people to be pleased. So this punishment of being up in my room while my parents were downstairs disappointed in me was a terrible punishment. But see, I disobeyed one of their rules. I had talked back to dad. I I had disobeyed. So that upset them, right? So they were upset, but they were also just and fair. So they realized that me breaking one of those rules deserved a punishment. So they punished me, and in my punishment, they punished me so that for the purpose that that wouldn't happen again, that I would learn from that and that I would grow as a person. So ultimately, they did so in love. So just as God does, my, my parents acted, and all of these different attributes, all of these different motivations came into play and magnified one another. They were wrathful. I don't know if it was that bad, but, but they were upset, all right? They were just in their punishment, but they loved me. And all of those things were magnified in this punishment. You see, and this is exactly the way God is. He is righteous in all of his ways, meaning that every single one of his attributes magnifies his righteousness, that he is love and wrathful at the same time because he is righteous in all his ways. But we also see that he is righteous in all his ways. We see that he is kind in all of his works. This means that everything he does is for our best interest. He is kind in absolutely everything he does. He is not a God solely focused on accomplishing goals, but he is a God who accomplishes his purpose of loving and caring for us, his creation. We cannot talk about and focus on the perfection of God by solely focusing on one attribute. We cannot focus on the perfection of God by simply looking at what he has done for us. 
and viewing the rest as rubbish. No, the perfection, the righteousness of God is this beautiful picture because it is a holistic picture of God's holiness. It is a holistic picture of God's righteousness, that he is a God of love. In those times when you don't feel loved, he is still a righteous God who has your best interest and my best interest in mind. Even when we don't feel it, God is a righteous God who is kind in all of his works. This idea that God, that we have a perfect and righteous God that doesn't interact with us then, all right? So so, so as we just sang about, said that I have a maker, all right? So we have this God who is the creator of all. But then the next verse of that very song is I have a father. So we know that he is this vast, righteous creator over all, but it doesn't end there, right? We have a righteous, perfect God, but we have a God who is intimate with us, all right, and that, that relates with us on a personal level. If we didn't believe this, this is something called deism. I don't know if you guys have heard of deism. Deism is the idea that God is this perfect God who created a perfect universe and then steps aside and let the universe do its thing. This is not what we believe in. This is not a scriptural God. This is not the God we serve. All right? Our God is, yes, he is a perfect God, but David also tells us that God is our provider. So we see that God is perfect, but we also see that God is our provider. We serve an amazing, all-powerful, majestic, holy, perfect God, a God that far supersedes any fictional superhero there is, a God greater than all of those things. But the thing that makes God so amazing is that not only is he a perfect God, but he is a God who provides for his creation. So what does it mean that he provides for us? Well, David tells us a few different ways in which he provides for us. The first is one of the most beautiful things in Scripture. It says that he is near to us. This nearness is a dear, intimate closeness, a constant comfort. I have the privilege of saying that I am a newlywed, all right? I got married mid-October last month. We've been married for about a month, and it has been pure bliss. We, we are one of those newlyweds that you just look at and you're sick because we are so adorable. <laughs> we are that great, all right? But we love each other, and we live in this very tiny efficiency, this tiny studio. So if we ever got into an argument, we never do, obviously, because we've only been married a month. But, but if we get into an argument, all right, there is no way to get away from one another. We are near to the extreme. There's no couch for me to sleep on, all right? We are near, but I wouldn't change it for anything because I, for once, get to experience this nearness that Scripture talks about. This closeness, this constant comfort, constantly having someone there with me to comfort me and console me when I'm overcome with stress or grief, she is there. I get to experience this nearness. Now think, if my wife is near to me, how much greater, how much greater is your creator going to be near to you? I love my wife. I love that I get to spend so much time with her, but the creator of the universe makes himself available to me 24-7. See, nearness is a gift that God provides his dearest creation. He provides for our greatest need. He provides himself. But he, he provides an application for this statement. So he's not just saying he is near to all. But he says he is near to all who call on him in truth. See, David calls us, tells us to call on him in truth in order for God to be near. Truthfulness is absolutely crucial for interpersonal communication, right? When we are talking with friends and family, truthfulness and honesty is, is crucial. It's important to build any sort of trust. And in our, creation, in our communication with God, it is no different. If not, it is magnified that truthfulness is a necessity. We must be truthful when we go before the Lord. I don't know about you, but I have a tendency not to do so. I have a tendency to go before God with this mask on. 
I have a tendency to go before God, even in times when I'm feeling hurt, go before God in prayer, saying, acting like I have it all together, just praying for everybody else. I have a tendency in my worship to go before God and stand here on a Sunday morning, even on Sundays that I am hurting, and call out to God as if everything is all right. I have a tendency to call out for God, call out to God, not in truthfulness, but with a mask. See, I believe that we as humans, we are a hurting people, a people in desperate need. But yet for some reason, when we go before the God of the universe, we may be broken, but we wear a mask of cheap Christianity. We wear a mask that we think other people will find appealing. In reality, God's desire is not for us to be perfect when we go before him. God's desire is for us to be truthful when we go before him. See, prayer isn't a time for us to present ourselves as the perfect offering. No time, prayer is a time for us to present ourselves as an offering. As an offering of worship, recognizing that the perfect offering has already been made. The perfect offering has already been made, and now we are simply a living sacrifice that is struggling daily in need of a Savior. See, we pray to God as if we are at a masquerade, and we present ourselves as fake but what God calls us to is truthfulness. We are in desperate need of a God who can truly make himself near. And that is what God promises us. He says he will be near to those that call on him in truth. Not only is he near, though, right? David says that he is near, but he also fulfills our desires. Let us look at the passage again. Starting in verse 18, it says, The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves him. You see, the Gospels tell us multiple times that God fulfills our desires. A few passages in Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. A very well-known verse. Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. John 15, 7 says, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. See, this righteous God provides our heart's desires. He fulfills our desires. We never have to doubt that fact, that we are his dearest creation, and he will provide. He will fulfill our desires. But David, again, makes a clarifying statement. He says he will fulfill our desires if we fear him. He will fulfill the desires of those who fear him. See, David's application is for us to fear God. It's for us to fear him. This is mentioned in different points throughout Scripture, right? Fearing God is the beginning of wisdom. So we have to ask, what is this idea of fearing God? Well, fearing God is this idea of total reverence to God. This idea of, of total reverence and awe bowing to his will. You see, this clarifying statement is so crucial because it's not just a blanket statement, I'm going to provide whatever your heart desires. Whatever you want, I'll give it to you. No questions asked but rather there is this clarifying statement. Christmas is coming, so wish lists are getting written, right? Letters are going out to Santa, letting, know, uh, letting him know what we want this Christmas. The hardest person to shop for in my family is my dad. He is the hardest person to shop for. I, I don't know why, um, maybe because he has everything he needs in me and his wife. I don't know, but oh, thanks, all right? But he is, he is the hardest person to shop for. Um, and so every year I ask him, what do you want? Just tell me what you want. Um, and I've realized that that is a terrible thing to go off of because what he wants, he doesn't want. He just sees someone else has it, I think. I don't know. There's been a few years where I ask him what he wants, and one year he said an MP3 player. So I got an MP3 player. I was so excited. They're going to get music he liked on there. He's going to use this. This is what he said he wants. He's never used it. I saw it in a drawer a few weekends ago. Another thing he said was an FM transmitter. So he wanted an FM transmitter so that he could use that MP3 player in his car and play music in the car. He never uses it. It just sits, sits in a drawer with the MP3 player. You see, what my dad said he wants, 
he didn't really want. Why is that? Because our desires are fleeting. Our human desires are fleeting. But those who fear God have greater desires. See, someone who fears the Lord is someone who has reverence for his will. So much reverence and awe that they place his will above their own. See, someone who fears the Lord is someone who respects God's will above his own. A holy heart only desires what a holy heart can give. Therefore, his desires, someone who fears God, their desires are fulfilled when God fulfills his desires. So he says, I'm going to provide, I'm going to fulfill the desires of your heart if you fear me. So simply because if we fear God, our desires are going to be godly desires. Desires that will further the kingdom of God. Fear God, and he will fulfill your needs. There are two specific ways in this passage that he mentions that he fulfills two of our desperate needs, two of our desperate desires that we may not even know we had. The first one says, he hears us. He hears us. The passage tells us that he hears our cry. If you guys watched those dad win videos on Facebook, they are fantastic. There's, those were just a few of them, but there's one that I absolutely love. There's one that I love. It's this baby that is crying in its crib. It's crying in its crib, and the dad simply walks in, crawls in the crib with the child, and the child cuddles with their father. See, this child is crying out, doesn't want to be alone, crying out, and who is there but their dad? Who is there but the one who gave them life? Their father. The father hears the child's cry and responds immediately. This is what we have with the God of the universe. The God of the universe looks at us and says, when you cry, I will hear you. That your cries are not falling on deaf ears, but your cries are falling on a God who passionately cares for you. You see, when we reach the point of truthfulness with God, there are going to be times when we simply need to cry out to him. When we come to the point that we allow God to see who we are, there are going to be needs when our only response is to cry out because we are in desperate need of a Savior. And we can be assured that in those times of hurt, in those times of grief, in those, in those times of brokenness, there is a God who is there to hear us. We are heard. But be encouraged because he is not simply an ear that hears, but is a hand that saves. As he says that he also saves us. Yes, he hears our cry and he comes to our instant call. But he doesn't come just to listen to what we have to say. He comes to save us. The salvation absolutely refers to the time when we surrender our lives to Christ, when we realize our sin. When we realize our sin, call out to God in need of a Savior, and he saves us. That absolutely applies to this, but it in no way ends there. Christ's role does not conclude at our salvation. It does not finish at the cross, but Christ's role continues on. See, Christ continues to save us. Psalm 34, 18, it's not going to be on the screens, but listen, it says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. You see, even those of us who are believers will have times when we are crushed and broken, and we can be sure that when we cry out, we have a God that hears us. We have a God who saves us. We discussed this a little bit in our life group last week. I would encourage you guys, if you're not involved in a life group, please get involved in a life group. It is such an incredible time of fellowship and growth. But in our life group last week, we talked about Christ's role of a saver is in no way over. But rather, he continually is standing at the right hand of the Father, hearing our cry and continually saving us. We see that he hears us, and we see that he saves us. We see, David says, this God of the universe He's a God that provides, and he provides by being near to us. He provides by fulfilling our desires. But he also provides by preserving us. 
we can be confident that the God of the universe will preserve us. He preserves us. Our God holds us in his loving arms and nothing will separate us. We see this in, in passages like Romans eight thirty eight and 39. It says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. We know that this God, this righteous God, will preserve us. But again, there's an application point. It says he preserves those that love him. He preserves those that love him, that actively love him. He preserves his children. If we are covered under the righteousness of Christ, we will always be covered under the righteousness of Christ. Our salvation will never fade, but our salvation will be preserved until we receive our full inheritance as children of God. This is not something we ever need to doubt. This is not something we ever need to worry about. But we can be confident in it. But look at what else David says. He gives a strong warning in this passage. He says, The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. If you're here this morning, and you haven't experienced this incredible salvation that we've been talking about. If you're here and you have yet to be forgiven of your sins, you have yet to recognize the sinful, broken person you are, you have yet to call out a God who can save you, please heed this warning. You see, we are broken people in need of a hero. And God provided his one and only son to stretch out his arms to be the hero that we need. Now when we recognize our need and we call out to him to transform our lives, we are united with Christ and his righteousness and able to spend eternity with him. He will forever provide and be near. He will preserve us. But those of you who have yet to do that, who have yet to make this decision, there is no greater passion, no greater need, no greater decision you will ever make than to surrender yourself to God. I can't, I can't plead with you enough to do that if you have yet to do that. As David said, if you are not a child of God, you're an enemy of God, and the wicked will be destroyed. Don't let that be you this morning. Please surrender yourself to God. We see that God is perfect, that he is a righteous, all-powerful God, that he is righteous in all his ways, he is kind in all his works. And this righteous God is not only a wonderful righteous God, but he is a God who provides for us. He is a God who provides for his creation. He makes himself near to us. He fulfills our desires. He preserves us. He hears our cry, and he saves us. I don't know about you, but that's a superhero that I want. So David then transitions. He spent the entire chapter talking about this incredible God this miraculous God that we serve, this righteous, glorious God who is worthy of our praise, this God who is good and generous, this God who answers our prayer. And now he transitions. Now what's our response? This is, there's this miraculous God that we have spent weeks studying and growing closer to. But now David provides his closing response. He says that God is to be praised. God is to be praised. See, after writing down these incredible words of his creator, his only natural response can be followed, my mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. See, our individual response is worship. 
Our individual response is worship, meaning me personally, my only logical response when I understand the magnitude of what God has done for me is worship. How can I look and, and study a righteous God, a holy God who provides himself to me, who saves me from my sin and my brokenness, and not respond in worship? See, our individual response has to be praise as David's was. But you'll notice that David doesn't end there. He doesn't simply end by saying what his response was. He doesn't conclude by saying what he did. But he ends rather by saying, let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. The word bless here describes the surrendering reverence to his holy name. The idea of bowing down to him forever and ever, blessing his holy name. Yes, individually, but our corporate response is also worship. That we together, our response to God's righteousness, our response to God's grace, our response to God's love is corporately to worship. It only makes sense that when we go before a God who provides for us, that we will worship him. In the beginning, I said that my dad was a superhero to me growing up. He was the first one there whenever I needed him. He still is. First one there to embrace me and love on me and cry with me when I cry. To pray with me when I need encouragement. He's my dad. How illogical would it be if I ran from that? Such a beautiful gift that I have. Such a beautiful gift that I have from my Father. He loves me, and in my return, I love him. But in our relationship with God, we so often blame him for our mistakes. So often blame him for our hurts, for our brokenness. And we lose sight, again, of God's perfection. We focus solely on the attributes and the actions that we desire. But rather, God is a righteous God. Our God is a perfect God. Our God is a God who wants to interact with us and communicate with us one and one, provide himself to us, to draw near to us on a daily basis so that when we're hurting and we cry out, he will be there to embrace us with his loving arms. This is the God we serve. This is the God that we have the privilege of coming before on a daily basis. The God of the universe, righteous in every single attribute, but also our Father who loves us despite our pain, despite our hurts, despite our mistakes. I would encourage you that as you leave today, that you heed to those applications that David gives us. that you speak truthfully with God, that you no longer present yourself as something fake, but rather you are truthful with who you are. I ask that you fear a God, a miraculous God, that deserves our reverence. I pray that you love him, actively love him, that all of these things together will come out in praise, both individually and join hand in hand with your family.